was awesome. Thank you, Webb. Whew. All right. Good morning, everybody. Hey, you got something worrying you right now. Just let that go and enjoy a wonderful day like this, worshiping Jesus in this wonderful uh, tent we're in. And uh, I hope you do enjoy that. Hey, I want to welcome all our first time guests. Let's give them a big hand. I have learned that it's next to impossible to sneak in here without a program, but if you manage to do that, stick your hand up, you're going to need it. Uh, Keith here will catch you and give you, see, way over there, somebody's going to hand them out. No, you don't need one, he's got two of them. <laughs> he's just pulling your chain there. Anyway, thank you all for coming out. Uh, in the program, you will have the words for the songs today, if you really didn't know Victory in Jesus. And uh, there's some good ones coming up there. Again, let all that tension go and just enjoy praising Jesus today. Hey, we got the, uh, we got the beach working. So hello to everybody on the beach. There's, there's a giant broadcasters out there. And we are making some noise out there. Woohoo! Awesome. They're going, I didn't know this happened every Sunday. It does. Hey, uh, we got a couple things I want to tell you about. We have information tables on both sides of the room, and there you can learn more about our church and uh, how it all works. We have these uh, next step cards. If you would like to get more involved or give us a prayer, prayer request, fill one of those out, um, and, uh, and you can take it when it's filled out, and you can put it in our giving station. So giving station is also where you can give an offering. There's three of them here. There's one there. See the sign? You can see it from all the way over here. And there's one all the way outside there if you miss those two. Uh, and we appreciate your, uh, your giving. Uh, we also, uh, if you uh, want to give by check or cash, you can do that. If you want to give by credit card, they can take that over at the info station on that side over there or debit. Hey, um, wanted to, I had one thing else I wanted to really point out today before we move on. And that is uh, Monday night, we do a Monday night replay. So somebody asked about it, he said it's not in your program, but every week we get together at the sports bar Perdido Key. That's 10 minutes east of here on, on this drive. And uh, we do free tacos. We have live music this week, Dave McCormick. And then we do a re replay of the, just the clip of, uh, uh, of what the main topic for our sermon is this week. And we talk about it at our tabletops. It's a lot of fun. It's a good way to meet new people and then kind of dig, dig a little deeper in today's topic. So uh, it's just something you can do. 6.30 every Monday night, and including this week. We'd love to have you. And free tacos. We feed you. We got a taco bar. Apparently, I left that off. That's awesome. Hey, I want to invite everybody to stand up. See if you found somebody who just got off the, done with the semester. They've been close to God and praying. Wish them a happy morning. Again, you have the lyrics in your handout, so please continue to sing along and worship with us. loves us today. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Singing, oh, how he loves us, oh, oh, how he loves us, how he loves us all. Go back and sing, he is jealous, he is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane, I am a tree. I'm bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so oh, oh, how he loves us How he loves us all
redemption and he is our prize a drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes and his grace is an ocean and we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss in my heart turns violently inside of my chest and I you today oh man how good is that good morning everybody well my name is Dan I'm the pastor here at the floor band we haven't met we're so glad you're here thanks for everyone hanging out up in the main bar well if you guys haven't been here over the last few weeks well last week we were at mullet toss how many guys got in on mullet toss how many stayed clear of mullet toss? Oh, man. It's like a nine to one ratio. They left our bikini stage up for us for Herb to perform later on today. <clears throat> we, uh, we're going to continue a conversation that we started before Molotov, but I got to tell you first something that happened just yesterday um, in my house. So I've got, uh, I got several kids, and they, um, they're our oldest is about to be 12, and our youngest is three, and so we pray a lot. <laughs> And there's, um, so there's, we got five total kids and three of the boys. So it's a, it's kind of a rough house house, you know, there's a lot of bumps and bruises and bloody knees and you know, all that goes. And, and then we got the girls, our two girls thrown in the mix of that they're right in the middle. It's every other boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. <clears throat> so the really cool thing is all the girls have an older and younger brother. It's kind of neat. And, um, well, my, uh, my six year old. Um, Enoch and my little girl Essie were wrestling around and playing and that's very common right super common and they're getting smacked and you can hear stuff you know but nothing crazy it's um, I know it sounded worse than it was they're getting smacked but you know what I mean so they're wrestling around and having a good time and then it got real quiet which for some people who don't have kids that's great if you do have kids you know that's trouble right especially when there's five running around. So little Essie, here's what I found out. I didn't know it at the time, but little Essie, she just turned five last week. She walked up and kicked Enoch. Now, um, they'd been kicking and punching, but she kicked him in his manliness, right? <laughs> now, he's six years old, and, um, and so he didn't like it, and he didn't know how to react. But I didn't, know, I didn't know that piece. I'm in the next room putting some papers in a desk. So I, I'm right there. I can hear, but I can't see. And so I didn't hear that, but I heard silence. And then I physically heard that young man boot his sister in the leg. I heard it. Whap! And then screaming ensued. <clears throat> there was a bunch of screaming and... And, um, and, you know, dad, I'm telling, you know, all that stuff. So Essie comes in and he, she tells me what happened. And, and so I had a little, I'll just say we had a little conversation with my son, 
right? And it was actually a really good conversation. I sat him down, I calmed Essie down, and all that was good. And, and um, I think it more freaked her out a little bit that, he, you know, I'm sure he was angry in the face. And all of a sudden they're playing, she thinks it's funny. And then he gets mad and kicks her back. So I don't know that he, but I mean, I heard it, you know. So we get her calm and situated. And of course, she wants a Band-Aid for everything. So um, it doesn't matter, you know. It hurts. My ear hurts. Can I have a Band-Aid? <clears throat> and so I bring Enoch down. Now listen, we had a great conversation. We have great family conversations. Growing up, I don't know if you had really good conversations or you had really bad conversations, or you didn't have conversations. That's usually kind of how it goes, right? Um, I can remember, oh, you're the best, Catherine, thank you. And so I do know that growing up, I didn't have a lot of those conversations. I had good conversations, but there weren't many. It was stop it, be quiet, you know, stuff like that. And. Uh, and so we do our best, we're not perfect and our kids are far from perfect, we do our best to have really good conversations. So Enoch and I sat down and we talked about what revenge means. And yes, you got kicked, but this is what it means to take revenge and what it means to get even. So we had a conversation about what it means to get even. And have you ever done that before? Yes, at school we talked about that. And, and, uh, and then we talked about our emotions and how to manage our emotions. You know, he's six years old, but I'm not going to treat him like a kid. He's a young man, you know, in my eyes anyways, you know. He should know how to manage his emotions at six years old. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but I want to have those conversations now and not wait till he's 15, right, when it's too late. So we're having these great conversations. But, and we talked about what it is to treat a lady a certain way. And all of that conversation was really good. But I was leading somewhere. I, I got to the spot where all that was done and he understood with his six-year-old brain. He did the best he could to understand what we were talking about. It was just a few minutes. And then I said, buddy, but let me just tell you something that's kind of for me as dad in this family that's most important to me. It's very important that you're respectful to, your, your, to ladies and it's very important that we don't seek revenge and, and our whole goal isn't to get even. It's very important that we manage our emotions. But let me tell you what's most important. And little Essie, if you've ever seen my little daughter, she's a little tiny little thing. She's the cutest thing in the world. Of course, I'm biased. But she's curled up over on the couch pouting, you know getting dad's love and attention and continuing to get it for the rest of the day. <clears throat> and, and I said, look at her over there, buddy. That's your baby sister. Her and your other four brothers and sisters are the most important people in the world. And we don't fight with our sister, we fight for our sister, right? And he said, okay, and then he ran outside and they jumped on the trampoline, everything was fine, you know? <laughs> it's like it never happened, which is great about kids a lot of times, right? They forgive and forget. I wish I was that forgiving and forgetting that quick, right? You get, you punch me, sorry, okay, we do this little thing where we put hands on shoulders and we say, say you're sorry, I'm sorry, Essie, will you please forgive me, yeah, and then they squeeze each other till they can't breathe, you know? <laughs> it's like it never happened. I love that about kids, I love that. But the conversation, I knew where I wanted to go because all of those things are true. We, we do need to be respectful and we do need to not seek revenge, but there was a most important element of this conversation. And that's kind of what we've been talking about over the last several weeks, that there are things in life that are important, very important, but there are a few, a handful of things that are most important important. For my son, I wanted him to walk away from that conversation knowing that all those things that I said were important. But there was something I really wanted to get at that he walked away with that was most important. That little girl needs your protection. She's your sister. And family is most important. It's not that other people aren't important. Everyone's important. But there are some people, and we're that way, right? We're that way. For some of us, there are, for I say all of us, we have some people that are most important in our lives. <clears throat> and some people that are important, but there are going to be people that get priority over other people. Isn't that true in our lives? Yeah, absolutely true. There are people in my life that will get priority over other people. I made a comment a couple of weeks ago that surprisingly got a, I got a bunch of people come up to me and, and, and uh, kind of jab me about it, but 
<clears throat> I, I usually try to focus one day a week where I don't do anything but focus 100% on my family. <clears throat> and it doesn't always work. And that day for me is often on Fridays. And I do my very best not to answer my phone. It's not because the people calling me aren't important. And of course, if there was an emergency or something, I'd jump all over it or whatever. But it's because there's, there's six other people. I got these five kids and my beautiful bride that are most important to me. And if I'm not careful, personally, I can't speak for you, but if I'm not careful, a lot of other people can get my attention and then my family gets left in the dust. And there are times when I have to jump and go do things, but, the, but for all of us, we have people that are most important, and that's not saying other people aren't important. There are things that we have that we highly value, right? Like items that we have. Maybe you have something that was given to you by someone of importance, right? Maybe a relative, a, a, a grandfather, a grandmother, a great grandfather, a great grandmother, and you value that. Now, it may not have a lot of monetary value, but to you, it's got this amazing value that you would give up something that maybe costs nothing for something that costs a lot, but this was, is, to you is more important. Now, we started a conversation these few weeks ago about what seems to be, if you were to open the Bible and read it through, what seems to be most important to God. Now, I want to preface this by saying that everything we believe in God's word is important. We believe that God's word is inspired and it is life-giving, but it seems as if Jesus talked about some things more than others and he put priority on certain things. It's very, very interesting. That's not to say other things aren't important. For example, Jesus was cornered one day and he was asked, of all the commands and all of the scripture, What's the most important command? So they're trying to trap them. Because if you say something's most important, then the other ones aren't important. That's how they were trying to trap them. By saying, oh yeah, the laws aren't important. There's only one that is. And Jesus in his brilliance answers like this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. And then he said, and there's another one just like it. It's not less important, it's of equal importance, and that's to love your neighbor as yourself. And so even Jesus, of all the hundreds of laws in the Old Testament, hundreds of them, he singled out a couple as most important. He was not saying that other laws aren't important, he was saying that there's a couple that takes supremacy over the others. In fact, he said, if you'll obey those two, you'll actually obey all those hundreds, right? So that's the first thing that we found out that's most important to God. We could summarize it like this. Love God and love people. Love God and love people. And then a couple weeks ago before Malthouse, we talked about the value of God's word on how God's word has to be important in our lives that we believe that God spoke, and the God's word demands our attention. It's God-inspired in life giving. Now, one of Jesus' very close followers, he was one of the disciples and considered one of the closer of the disciples, this young man named John, who wrote several books in the New Testament, actually. He wrote the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is the fourth, the last of the Gospels. He also wrote the very last book of the Bible called Revelation. And then right before that, there's a few letters. There's these three shorter letters, shorter than John, shorter than Revelation, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John that he wrote, these letters to people and to churches, to Christ followers. And I want to take a look at just part of one of those letters as we continue our discussion on what's most important. If you've got your program with you, hey, by the way, if you didn't get a program when you walked in, you snuck by us somehow, just shoot your hand up. All the verses we're going to read are going to be in your program, so you just shoot your hand up and we'll get you one. <clears throat> First John 3, verse 11. Now, if you're looking for a great place to start reading the Bible, personally, I love 1 John. It's a phenomenal book. And it's short, which is always a bonus when you're jumping in to read something, right? It's just a few chapters, 
And the really cool thing about John, you could say this about a lot of books of the Bible, but one of the very cool things about John was he was an actual disciple. He was with Jesus for those several years when, after he called him before Jesus went to the cross and he was raised from dead and ascended to heaven. He had firsthand interactions with Jesus. This wasn't someone that heard about something from somebody who heard about something from somebody that was there. Second, third hand information. This is directly from one of Jesus' closest, closest friends. Start reading John. You'll get through it in a day. Even if you read a chapter a day, you'd get it through before next Sunday. Here's what it says. First, John 3.11, he's reiterating what Jesus actually said when he was on the earth. He said, this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. I love that. John's saying, hey, the message hasn't changed. We change, right? Society changes. Governments change. But the message is the same from the beginning. We are here for each other. We're not against each other. What's interesting to me about that is that John, just several years after Jesus left, is having to remind everybody. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I lose focus on what's most important. If I'm not careful... And so just several years after Jesus leaves, John's having to remind everybody, hey, hey, there's lots of important stuff, but let's not forget, though things are changing, the message hasn't changed. That's good news. And I'll say this, 2,000 years later, the message hasn't changed. Now, we've changed, right? Right? Governments are going to change. We're going to get older and life's going to change and people are going to change. But the message of Jesus remains the same. Love is God's primary focus. Amen. Now, he goes on to say this in verse 16 of chapter 3. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. He's keeping us back on message, right? This thing's about Jesus. It's not about me and how great I am. <clears throat> So we also ought to give ourselves for our brothers and sisters, keeping them on focus. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how does God's love, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let us not merely say we love each other. Let's show truth by our actions. I grew up hearing a saying that you probably have as well, that actions speak louder than... <clears throat> yeah, I grew up hearing that all the time. And I would say I agreed with it, but until you have been hoodwinked by somebody who said they loved you, I don't know that you can feel the complexity and the weight of that statement. I don't know if you have ever been hurt by someone who loves you, but there is no worse, in my opinion, in my short life, my experience, there's no worse pain than being hurt by someone who looked at you and said they loved you, but their actions said something different. That's painful. It's painful. It's painful to know what this person has done and in trying to hide it, they still talk to you as if nothing is wrong. Amen. That is painful, obviously, for some people, right? <laughs> it's super painful. And it can stir up all kinds of emotion and hate and anger. And, and John, the writer of this short letter, interestingly enough, so when I read the Bible, I ask myself all kinds of questions. Right? I ask myself, who's writing this? Who are they writing this to? Why are they writing this? One of my favorite questions to ask is, why did that writer feel like that was important to put in there? Right? <clears throat> but one of the questions I always ask myself is, what could the writer have said that they didn't say? And right here, what I would have put in, <laughs> what I would have wrote in there was... Love those who reciprocate love. I would have said something like, hey, love people, yes, it's really good, but don't love those 
who end up stabbing you in the back, distance yourself, get away from them, and don't show love. I would have said that because, I don't know about you, I have been hurt by someone who has said to me they loved me or they showed loyalty and then they, just like that, turned. Or maybe when that person could no longer get what they wanted from you, they just kind of left your life. Those people, in my opinion, outside of Christ, right, don't deserve my love. They haven't earned it. Matter of fact, I would say they spat on my love. So they're not getting any from me. Now, John could have written that in there. He's a normal human being. I'm sure he felt those emotions before. <clears throat> Just because he was a disciple doesn't mean he was impervious to hate or anger or frustration towards people. How about this guy is writing that while his life is in danger, by the way? He's being chased down by those in authority to be killed. He's the only disciple that died of old age, John. All the other disciples were killed in some form or fashion for being a proclaimer of the message of Jesus Christ. And they tried to kill him. They threw him in a vat of boiling oil, trying to kill him. But he survived. He survived. And spent the remainder of his years exiled on an island where he eventually wrote the book of Revelation. You want to talk about a guy who could be harboring some bitterness and some anger? And here he is out shouting about loving people, care for them, show them goodness. But why? <clears throat> why is that a thing? It goes back to the first couple lines in the verse that we just read. Here's what it says. We know, we've experienced, we've seen what real love is. Jesus gave up his life for us. So, as a result, we also ought to love others. <clears throat> because if there was anyone who could have been upset and angry if there's anyone who could have withheld love, it could have been Jesus dying on that cross. All right, this is enough. I, try, I came for you people because I loved you, and this is what you do to me. We're done. This thing's over. But because he didn't, because he chose to love anyways, John is saying, how could we not love with that example for us. And not only that, then when we open up our lives to Christ, something supernatural happens. His love comes to make its home in us. And then we can love in a way that makes no earthly sense. No earthly sense. I don't know if you've ever watched, got, um, spent a, a few hours, sometimes like an afternoon, just like uh, scanning through YouTube videos, you know? <clears throat> I do. So, I watched, it popped up as a recommended video just the other day of this woman in court, court hearing. It's just about a two-minute video to show the whole court case of the man, really he was a kid, this kid who murdered her son. And at the hearing where he was sentenced, she stood up, she walked over, she gave this young man a hug and said, I love you and I forgive you. That doesn't make any earthly sense. None, zero. It makes no earthly sense. So I don't know where this woman's face's at, I, I don't know, but come on, how, how do you pull that off? Someone that you should hate and despise? Someone that you should hold a fence against for the rest of your life? And yet... I love you and I forgive you. That is supernatural. It's supernatural. The reason I know it's supernatural is because I've tried to love certain people and it just isn't possible sometimes. You know what I mean? There's just something about certain people you just want to throat punch, you know? 
and you're laughing, not because that's funny, but because you're thinking of a person you want to throat punch. <laughs> And then, and then John does something erroneous. He takes it a step further. And it seems like Jesus is always taking things a step further. He was, he was out preaching to all these people one day. And uh, for three days, the disciples had been serving people and helping people and loving people and praying for people for three days. And then they said, the disciples said, hey, um, these people are getting hungry, and uh, we should send them away so they can eat. We're done. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're done. Jesus took it a step further. Why don't we feed them? Let's figure out how to feed these people. Then he took the five loaves and two fishes and, you know, the famous story, and then they fed thousands of people. Jesus always takes things a step further. We're done. It's been too long. Let's feed them also. So John takes it one step further and he says if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion how does that love that we're talking about how does that love it can't be true God's love can't live in a person that's all talk and no action so yes love and it's difficult and it's hard but then Jesus takes it another step and he says crazy stuff like, don't just love, love your enemy. Don't just be kind to people who are kind to you. Be kind to those who persecute you. Pray for those people who use you. And don't just love, be generous to people. What's very interesting to me, and <clears throat> listen, there are people that know the Bible way better than me They've been studying it for as many years as I've been alive, so I don't pretend to know everything about Scripture. <clears throat> but if you were to start in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, the book of Origins, Genesis, and you were to read through all 66 books, over 31,000 verses, you would find a theme that seems most important to God, one of those most important things is love always equals generosity. It's a very strange, interesting correlation throughout the Bible. Just think about the most famous scripture in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave. For God so loved that he gave. Even the most famous verse in all of the Bible itself shows love equals generosity. And I will say that this is maybe the most difficult topic in all of Scripture. Do you know that Jesus himself in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talks about generosity more than any other topic. There is not a topic he covers more than generosity. Not a single one. He talks about it twice as much as most other topics. Just read through his parables. It's about giving and stewarding. Stewarding so you can give. Managing your finances so you can be generous or your possessions. It appears that you can talk about love, though it may be difficult, and still not be full of God's love. And the proof of God's love living within you is not that you talk about it. It's actually in your generosity. Now, what I'm not going to do is define for you how you have to be generous. That's the easy thing to do, especially in churches and we, you know, money gets talked about and people freak out. So I'm not going to I'm not going to go down that path of how you specifically should be generous. But I'll say this, Generosity matters to God. And so as a Christ follower, if you are a Christ follower, there's a, there's a couple decisions we have to make today. First, let's step back from our conversation today <clears throat> that we're talking about love and generosity. Let's just step back and ask this question to ourselves. If we knew what was important to God, would we then make it important to us? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves. That's really what this teaching series is about. It's there are things that are important to you, and they should be. 
But what we don't start with is what's most important to me. We start with what's most important to God, and then we adopt that into our lives as what's most important to me. And so if loving your enemy isn't on your priority list, it's not important to you, I understand that, God understands that, but what he's saying is, it's time to change because you now know that that's important. So we have to make that as a first decision, as a Christ follower. That we're going to make the decision that what's most important to God becomes most important to us. And to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. if that's not priority number one, then our prayer is, God, make it priority number one in me. Even when it's difficult. <clears throat> if... A couple weeks ago, we talked about God's word. If, if God's word isn't a priority to you, but we find out it's a priority to him, then we make it a priority to us. And then today, our conversation specifically is about love equals generosity. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, if generosity is important to God, then I have to ask myself, how important has generosity been to me? Now, John specifically here, he mentions money. But we all know that's not the only thing in our lives that we can or cannot be generous with. Right? Generosity of our time. Generosity of our things. Generosity of our attitude and our words to people. How I, we don't question that. My wife is so good at this, and I'm so bad. My wife is one of the most generous people with her words. You know what I mean? You ever been around somebody? Yeah, someone knows my wife. She is. <clears throat> my wife will shower, and she's not BSing yet. Like, she really believes it, right? She's so generous with her words to people. And it's very annoying because then it makes me look bad when I'm not as generous, you know? I'm like, hey, tone it down, babe, you know? Making me look bad. <clears throat> it appears that if you were to open the Bible and you were just to ask yourself, God, of all the things in this whole 66 books, what seems to be most important? One of them, there's a handful, one of them is generosity. One of them seems to be that love compels us to be generous to others. Amen. Now, how that looks for you and how that looks for me may be different. And the person next to you may be different from the person next to you, but either way, generosity must become important to us. Now, here's what I would love to. I'd love to say a prayer for you. But really, can I be really honest with you? This conversation is loaded. And there's no way we've, we jumped all the way in on what generosity means and how should we should be generous and what, in what ways we can be generous. So my prayer is not that we just make a decision today, but that we jump into, I'll just tell you what I'm praying for me and my family, <clears throat> that I jump into a lifelong pursuit of living a generous life. And that daily, God would show me how to be more generous. There's an old saying, and it's not in the Bible, but it could be. I mean, it's solid. <clears throat> you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Those two things are married to each other. Let me say a prayer for you this morning, if that's okay. <clears throat> Father, I'm so grateful that you loved us so much that you gave your son. It's a verse that we know, and it's a verse that we've maybe even heard preached. It's a verse we see on football games right behind the goalpost there, John 3, 16. And hidden in that verse is this amazing truth that love gives. That love equals generosity. God, I need to be more generous. 
like, I want to be more generous. I want your love to fill my heart and then overflow in generosity to others. I want that to be a mark of my life. I, it's important to you, God, so God, I ask that you make it important to me and my family. And I pray that also for my church family here. Those up in the main bar, those that are going to be watching online. God, I pray that you fill our hearts with such a fierce love that it compels us to be generous. Lord, it may not be easy. So I ask you to transform our hearts to be people who are known as people of generosity. We pray in Jesus' name. The Floor Bama family said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. All right, I'm going to invite everybody to stand up. We say this every week, it's a very true statement. Romans 8 tells us that if God is for us, who can be against us? We'll see you next week. Thank you.